Welcome to the Lemonade Stand Stories podcast. Tune in every Thursday as we share inspirational stories from the world's greatest creators, entrepreneurs, and go-getters about how they've turned life's lemons into lemonade. And now, here's this week's host, the CEO of Lemonade Stand, Derek Miner. Welcome to the Lemonade Stand Stories podcast. So excited to have at Lemonade Stand, Utah headquarters, Paul Shin. Paul is the founder of Tacos Together, also a world record holder. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> and one of the most selfless community builders that I know. And so honored to have you on our podcast today. Well, uh, you built me up too much, but but thank you, man. Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Oh, so glad to have you. So first of all, we were just talking about Mother's Day and all the amazing things and ideas that were coming about. How was your Father's Day? Uh, it was uh, it was incredible. You know, we went down to Springville. There's a little lake out there. Hung out with good friends. Uh, my wife let me sleep in till 9.50 Sunday. <laughs> and I kid you not, I woke up and I thought it, was, it, was like it had to be daylight savings, right? Because <laughs> I don't know the last time I slept in until 9.50. None of the kids woke me up. I was very, very confused for a good 20 minutes. Uh, but yes, it was an amazing weekend. Oh, How about yours, man? So great. Yeah, love Father's Day. It's fantastic. You know, one of my friends said that 99% uh, of the reason that we even get to celebrate Father's Day is because of our amazing wives, right? That's, I mean, 100% true. So, no, it's great. Love love the opportunity um, to just be with family and even be with my, my father who's aging. And that just puts a whole thing in you know, kind of a whole new perspective into life, For right? Sure. When you're around a father and trying to enjoy and make the most of these moments that we have in life. Isn't it funny how that works, right? Like I remember being a kid and all I wanted to do was hang out with my dad. And then I remember being a teenager and all I wanted to do was not hang out with my dad. <laughs> right. Right. And now like, as I get older, I'm like, it is, it is like these moments that matter. Mm -hmm. Right. And all the other, all the other crap just kind of falls away. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you talk about your dad and, you know, I, I love a question who inspires you, right? Yeah. Are there uh, others, your dad, maybe anyone else who inspires you in your life? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question, man. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. There's a lot of people. Uh, and the crazy part is that like the vast majority of them, I don't, I don't know by name. Right. Uh, I know that for some people it's, you know, a famous athlete or, you know, I don't know. Elon Musk, whoever. And like, I have no problem with any of them. I just don't know them. Right. And what I have found is regular people just doing good things. I mean, that made huge, profound changes in my, I mean, quite literally saved my life. And I am continually inspired by, by that, right? The regular people who live everyday lives, and they just do small things that make huge impacts for other people. Uh, I mean, that that's really it, man. I mean, my wife, not that she's, she's, she's an extraordinary person. Yeah. I just want to put that out there for the record. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, she inspires me. My kids inspire me. But a lot of it is just that, man. The kindness of complete strangers and seeing like the good that community does, like that keeps adding fuel to the fire. Yeah, that's so true. I think some of the most inspiring moments that I've seen are people who don't get recognition yeah. and you're able to say or share something with them and, and they say, thank you. Right. Because they oftentimes they go unnoticed and are invisible, yeah. but yet our daily lives are propped up by so many people who seem to be invisible. Yeah. And when you take an opportunity to recognize them, but I love that idea about who inspires you. It's the people, just the everyday people yeah. that make a big difference, you know, in, in everything that we do. I, I want to, I want to know too, as we talk about this building, and, and creating, you are selflessly building an amazing community here in Utah. And as I think about Tacos Together came into the market kind of as its own unique thing, right? And making these, these connections, which I absolutely love. And everyone talks about connection. We were just talking about this at, at lunch. Yeah. We're so connected today, but yet there's a lot of disconnection. Sure. How, how, what do you see and how are you bringing some of those things, you know, real genuine connection together? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, if I could rewind just a little bit, right. A lot of this idea came from, uh, my wife asked me to take my kids to the playground like back in 2020. And she made me promise that I wouldn't get on my phone, which was a big deal. <laughs> Right. Cause I mean, that's just what you do. You right. get on your phone. Um, 
And it was fascinating, right? I know that this is pretty common knowledge, but to actually see it, right? To see my kids go to the playground and immediately just find other kids and become friends, right? Like within 15 minutes, man, like my daughter's playing house, my son's going off into space, fighting monsters. I don't know. <laughs> but it's like, it's so innately built in all of us that we want to be connected with other people, right? We've made it way more complex than it needs to be. Because we all want to connect. I mean, why do we go to a literal networking event? Yeah. Right? And then I'm guilty of it, right? I know what it's like to go to a networking event and pull out your phone and act like you're really busy, like writing an email or something in the hopes that people won't talk to you. <laughs> and yet, like, you're at an event where you're supposed to connect with people. Right? And uh, I don't know. I remember that day. And I remember going home. And I remember thinking about the literal hundreds of lunches and networking events and conferences and trade shows that I've been to and the thousands of business cards. And I realized like, I didn't know a single person there, right? Like if I, if I had gone through the entire stack, I couldn't tell you who any one of those people were. And uh, I don't know, something about that, that just like, that just sat wrong with me, right? We all want to make connection. We all want to be connected. And yet we built systems that make it so complex and so difficult for real connection to happen. And, you know, again, like, you know, who inspires me, right? My children inspired me there. Maybe human connection isn't as hard as we make it out to be. Maybe it's just we play. Maybe we share lunch together, right? We go fight bad guys together. Yeah. Next thing you know, we're, we're friends. Yeah. And with like friends are the people I want to be with. I want to do business with my friends. I want to support my friends. I want to help my friends. I genuinely want to hang out with my friends. And I realized like a lot of the people around me are also looking for friends. And that was know, at least a part of how this whole thing started. Yeah. I love that idea of, because oftentimes, you know, when we're in trouble, first people we're going to reach out to or the first person that reaches out to us or usually our friends or those that are closest to us. And you bring up a good point, you know, there's, um, it is hard to ask for help, right? Yeah. And the truth of it is that there's a lot of people out there that would be willing to help you if they knew what you were going through, but it's really only your friends and family that can often tell. And sometimes even they can't tell, but if anyone's going to be able to tell that something's wrong, it's those people closest to us. Right? And so having that network and that safety net and those connections are, I mean, again, at least in my case, like literally life-saving. Yeah. And and I love that story, you know, of, of you and how, how I'm just grateful you're here. <laughs> Thank you, man. You know, and I know there's a lot of people that are grateful you're here. You've been very vulnerable and open sharing your stories of struggle and challenge. But isn't it interesting that those that surround us and rally around us during the challenging times are the relationships that are the strongest yeah. and continue uh, to be the strongest. I really want to get into collaboration, yeah, yeah, right? Those that you're collaborating with, other people that are doing amazing things because uh, you, you've done things with um, Make-A-Wish Foundation mm -hmm. and you're also a world record holder, which I want to talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. But not being a world record holder, but what led to being a world record holder sure. and, and what happened as part of that. Everyone sees, oh, we set a new record. But you've done some amazing collaborations with companies and teams and people that are trying to do good. What through that experience has inspired you the most? Uh, you know, there's a couple things there. Uh, I think one is there is a level of, there's a level of ego that I didn't even realize I had, right? Or sometimes you, you start something and you're like, no, no, this is my community and I'm building it the way I want and it has to be the best. <laughs> and, you know, not that we don't want the best for the community that we're building, but it, I mean, again, it was actually, I'm, I'm a little ashamed to admit how long it took for me to realize other communities aren't my competition, right? Like if we truly believe in community building, right? if, we're, if we really believe that community is just people getting together and these connections that are being formed, then it doesn't matter which community you end up in, right? It doesn't matter which organization you end up in. And the reality of it is to say like, oh, Derek should only belong to one community is insanity. Yeah. Right? Like I like pizza, but yeah. I also like tacos. <laughs> right? Like I can have both. Pizza uh, wasn't the first thing I thought you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that's the truth, right? Is yeah. that on any given day, you're allowed to be whoever you are, right? And if you're, I don't know, if you're super into startups, that's great. Like you should be a part of a startup community. 
But if you're also super into biking, then great. Like you should find a biking community too. And again, to say that those two are competition is, I mean, that's insanity, right? Yeah. It really is like, let's find homes for all the people. And uh, and again, as, as I've thought about that a lot, it has turned into, well, a lot of these organizations, a lot of these other community organizations, a lot of these companies, they're not, they're not my competition. So let's work together. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is where one plus one is three. Yeah. Right. Where together we go a lot further and we do a lot more good. Uh, I was talking to a mentor the other day and uh, he talked about like, he's like, it's like a rocket ship. Right. And he said, the problem is that if you have a hundred rockets, each one with a little bit of gas in the tank, none of them are going to get off, like get off the ground. But if you were to pull all that gas into one tank, everyone can go wherever they want to go. Right. And Great I don't know. I, yeah. I love that. Right. It was like, okay. Instead of all of us getting frustrated and all of us blaming each other and all of us not going anywhere, like when we choose to work together, we go way further and all of us win, right? Those are the, I mean, that includes the sponsors, that includes the attendees, that includes like the amazing organizations that we get to work with. Like we make wins for everyone when we can work together. Yeah, I love that. And as you were talking about your setting, tell us a little bit about this world record, the largest (laughs) fort ever. Yeah. Um. So to rewind the history of that, again, a lot of my inspiration does come from my children. Uh, I promised them that we would go play, and it was a rainy day. And so I said, well, how about we watch a, a family movie instead? And I don't know why, but my daughter was like, well, can we build a blanket for it? And then we'll watch a movie. And I was like, okay, like let's go to Home Depot, and we'll get some PVC pipe, and we'll like build out this fort. Because I wasn't quite sure how it all fit under like a, a regular <laughs> blanket fort, yeah. right? And as we built out this blanket fort, you know, it was a five by five by five cube, basically. Uh, but the whole family could fit in there. And we were watching this movie. And this is inside. This is inside, awesome. right? Because it's raining outside. Yeah. And um, that was kind of the initial idea, right? Of like, well, it was kind of fun hanging out in the in a blanket fort, right? It made me feel like a kid again. And it was a lot of fun to build. And that turned into, well, what if we could do a whole meeting, like a whole event inside of a blanket fort? Which then turned into like, what if we built the largest blanket fort ever, uh, which is, you know, I think our world record is just under 10,000 square feet. Wow. Uh, the previous guys were, I think, just over 6,000. So it was it was cool to see that. Um, but the reality of that moment was, uh, you know, I announced it to the to the community, like, hey, this is the event. Like, we're going to go break this, this blanket fort. And uh, I realized, man, I had no idea how hard that was going to be. Right. Uh, one, I did not realize how much blanket you genuinely need for 10,000 square feet of a <laughs> fort. I also did not think at all about like, how do you frame out a fort to, to stand? Right. Like none of these thoughts had crossed my mind. And, um, you know, the amazing thing about it is it was just regular people coming together. I mean, 500 people showed up with, you know, a handful of blankets each. Uh, there's an organization uh, that like they, they reached out and they provided a ton of other blankets, right? A different organization, uh, an event stack. Martin's a good friend. Um, they they donated all the, the piping to frame this whole thing out. We were going to build it on the RSL, like the Real Salt Lake field. And then the night before there was like thunderstorm warnings. Right, right. And the I thought is like, that. well, we probably shouldn't have a bunch of people out on a field with like 10 foot metal poles. Right. <laughs> right. And like last minute, uh, the Giver Hub guys, you know, called and said, hey, like we have a giant warehouse. You guys need a space. We're happy to host you. Uh, and it, it was just one little miracle after another. Right. And it's easy to look at any one of them and say, well, that wasn't that big of a deal. You know, this guy brought three blankets. It didn't matter. But we needed every one of those to make the entire world record happen. And I, I don't know if everyone even knows, but the the really cool part after all of that was said and done, uh, every one of those blankets were donated to a couple of the homeless shelters here in the area. Uh, but the coolest part was um, there was this five year old kid, Link, and one of his things that he wanted, uh, he was a Make a Wish kid, and one of the things he wanted to do was be a part of a world record. So he was able to come and put the last blanket up on the fort. And uh, we put his name on the plaque with us. So uh, it was just a, an incredible experience. That is so cool. And how did you get connected with him? You know, it was kind of the same thing. Just 
the community, right? As I've met other people, uh, someone was like, hey, you should totally meet. Her name is Summer, who's over at uh, Make-A-Wish Utah. Had an amazing connection with Summer. And then, you know, I said, hey, like, I'd love to do some collaboration. Like, how do we, how do we work together? Right. And this isn't like a, you need to pay me money or I pay you money. It literally is how do we work together to, to make the event better for everyone who's attending, but also, I mean, to change a kid's life, right? Like yeah. to make a wish come true. And uh, Summer has been an amazing partner. Make a wish has been an amazing partner. And, uh, you know, we've done a, we've done a couple make a wish events ever since then. And it's just been, each one's just special in its own way. Yeah. Are there others that you can think about that as you, as you think back on some of these memories and these moments that are created, are there some that stand out to you? Yeah. Um, last Christmas. So I, I was born in Seoul, Korea. And, um, so I'm, I'm a first generation immigrant and I remember I was probably, I don't know, maybe four. I was, I was young. It was the, it was like one of the very first Christmases I could remember. Right. And it was here. And ironically enough, it was actually in Salt Lake. My dad was going to the U, uh, in their med school program. And I remember beforehand, before Christmas, I was all worried about like, does Santa even like, like, will Santa bring me anything? Right. I didn't know. I didn't know if it was like for white kids only. I didn't know if you knew I'd moved. I didn't know any of these things, right? And um, I remember that year, the only thing under our tree was a a, a chocolate bar, a candy bar. And, um, you know, I, I know it's easy to look at that and feel disappointed. But the for me, I remember thinking like, oh, like I, I was ecstatic because that meant that like Santa didn't forget me, right? That he he saw me. And um, this last Christmas, we did a, an ugly sweater fashion show. So people got to dress up and walk the runway. And, you know, we have the Lamborghinis and all that uh, next to it. But the really cool part is that we asked the community kind of the same thing. We said, hey, uh, if you can, bring a toy or two to donate. And uh, the community brought in over $50,000 of toys. Wow. It took two moving trucks to, to distribute them all. Right, and each one of those went to children from either low-income families, uh, inside children's hospitals, first responders. Uh, you know, and it was just amazing to see, like, quite literally thousands of toys that, again, the community brought together. Right, and then they went to go help thousands of kids. Right, like again, and it's easy to look at one teddy bear and say, like, well, what difference does that make? But to like that one kid, it makes a huge difference, right? Yeah. There's that kid out there that. He just wants to be seen, right? He just wants to know that he's not forgotten. Right. Like it matter to that kid. So again, I'm just, so going back to your very first question, it really is. And I know it sounded kind of corny, but it really is as we do these events, but also as I just get to be with people in the community, I am constantly inspired by the amazing good that these like unsung regular people, like unsung heroes, regular people are doing all the time. Yeah. I love that. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing some yeah, of those of stories. Course, that is awesome. Cause you think, you know, you see the do good stickers all over yeah. and there's a lot of people who want to do good, Yeah, but sometimes they don't know where until they're asked the right question. Sure. You know, and I think questions that you were asking, uh, of, of yourself and then you ask those questions that resonates with other people. And you think about these small things that make the biggest impact. Yeah. You know, long term. That's that's incredible. Um and and starting anything has its challenges, right? Sure. And there's always obstacles. Did you think when, you know, maybe you can talk about some of those obstacles that you've overcome, but did you ever think that Tacos Together would be where it is today? Oh, no. I mean, uh, you know, not not to say that we are a massive uh success by any means, but uh man, um just to rewind a little bit if if you're okay yeah. with that. So growing up in a very traditional like Asian household, uh, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on like, you have to get good grades because that would mean you get a good job, right? And as the man of the house, like your job is to provide for your family. And I, I spent a lot of, like a lot of my youth thinking like, okay, so happiness is making $100,000 a year. Like that's what made sense to me, right? And I remember making $100,000 a year and, you know, after the, the initial excitement wears off, you realize like, I'm not any happier. Honestly, I might be less happy. And uh, it took me a long time because, you know, I'm not the brightest bulb in the room, but that's okay. Uh, it took me a little bit of time and I realized, but I thought like, okay, well, maybe the problem is the number was just too low, 
right? I didn't yeah. think it was the wrong metric. I just thought the amount was wrong. Yeah. Right. So then I remember thinking like, okay, the goalpost is actually 150,000 a year. Right. That went up to 200,000 a year. Right. And actually, you know, it's at a quarter of a million a year and you're still like each step I took, I found that I was more and more unhappy. Right. And then I remember at one point I thought, okay, well, maybe I needed more, more power, more, you know, more recognition, more fame. Right. And so I joined these other guys who, uh, who started, a you know, uh, an AI scheduling tool. Right. And I thought, okay, well, like my face should be on the cover of Forge magazine. Like that's what will make me happy. Right. Like all the, all the recognition of being a, a startup founder in the tech scene. And, um, you know, after a while, like that didn't work out either. And the honest truth is after all those things were said and done, like I was, uh, I made plans to commit suicide. I like, that was it. Like my weight had ballooned up. I was over 300 pounds. I was diagnosed diabetic. My wife and I were fighting. I don't feel like I was a good father. Like all these things had fallen apart as I chased all these things that the world told me to go chase. And, um, you know, I, I remember I made this post and it was at the end of the year, you know, at the end of year on, on LinkedIn, there's all these, you know, all the awards that you win and all the growth that you have. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I don't discredit that. I think it's amazing. You should definitely celebrate your wins. Yeah. I was just in a dark place and, um, and I was angry. And so, you know, I took a picture of my unfinished desk and I was telling people like the other side of being an entrepreneur is like. Right. You work in a crappy desk in an unfinished basement and after, you know, however, whatever, like the only thing you have left to show for it is like you become a diabetic. Yeah. And um, I remember that post. Yeah. Thank you. And um, yeah, you know, and I, I don't know. I was angry. I didn't really care what anyone thought anymore. But all these random people reached out right? and they were just saying, hey, are you OK? What can I do to help? Right? Like some guy like paid my mortgage for a couple months. Right. Wow. Like. Someone bought Christmas presents for my kids that year. And um, the real blessing behind all of that was it gave me time to reflect and try to understand, like, why like why was I pulled away from the ledge, right? Because I get it. Like, there's some alternate universe where, like, Paul doesn't exist anymore, right? But, like, why am I here? And what am I supposed to do with this whole thing? And... Um, that, that was it. Like, that's when I realized that community had saved my life, right? Like when you are that alone or sorry, when you are in that dark of a place, all you feel is alone, right? Right. There's 8 billion people on this earth and you feel like not a single person can see you or hear you, or understand you. And then the solution to that is as soon as you feel connected with somebody, even one person, right? All of a sudden you don't feel alone anymore. And that gives you just enough fuel to to go fight for whatever you want to go fight for, and that was the that was kind of the origin of this thing, right? Is it was never meant to even be a a business per se, right? It was just this mission I had, where I thought, okay. The reality of it is that I was on a ledge, and I felt like I was the only person there, but if I could put a spotlight on it, I would find millions of people on that ledge, right? Just none of us can see each other, right? And, you know, Tacos wasn't started to necessarily be a mental health organization. It was just that. It was human connection. And human connection is whatever you want it to be, right? Maybe you need a friend. I mean, maybe you are on the verge of, of suicide, right? Maybe you're just terrified out of your mind. Maybe you're just new to Salt Lake and you want to make a friend or you want to go fishing or play video games. I don't know. And my job isn't to, to judge the validity of why you want human connection. I just wanted to make human connection simple. Like that became the mission. And, uh, you know, I know you talked about challenges. The first challenge was uh, having to go talk to my wife who was scarred from the last startup <laughs> and tell her that I wanted to go in on this startup. And she's like, okay, so uh, walk me through it. Like, what's the, what's the plan? Like, how are we going to make money? Right. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And she's like, okay, but like, you're going to charge people to come. And I said, no, I think it should be free because the guy who can't afford $10 is probably the guy who needs us the most. She's like, okay, but like, are we going to make money on the tacos? I was like, I think I'm going to feed people. <laughs> and so she's like, okay, so you're going to quit your job. I think I got another job by then, right? And she's like, so you're going to quit your job. We had just dug ourselves out of the last hole. 
and your business plan is to do free events and feed people for free. And I was like, yeah, I think that's the plan. <laughs> right? Um, you know, the, the interesting thing is uh, when you're an entrepreneur, and I don't know, maybe you're not guilty of it, and I hope you're not. But my previous startup, I realized I had boxed my wife out. I didn't want her to know how bad things were. Right, And I thought I was doing her a favor. I thought mm-hmm. I was saving her from all this extra stress. And uh, with this one, and I don't know what inspired it exactly, but you know, I told her, like, look, at the end of the day, like, you tell me what you want me to do. I want you to be involved in this, in this decision. And she took a couple days to kind of digest it all. And she came back, and she actually was the one that said, I think you should do this. She's like, I don't know why, but I get it. Like, I feel the same thing you feel. I know this is where you're supposed to be. And I have no idea how we're going to make this work. Uh, but, like, let's go down this road together. So, I mean, very first challenge was understanding that, like, hey, I can't do this alone, right? I need my wife. I need her to. I need her support. And, like, yeah. we're partners in this thing. Uh, and honestly, every other challenge since then, right? How are we going to afford this? How are we going to get a sponsor? I mean, even crazy things like we, you know, we ended up taking over the the U of U field last year and we're doing it again yeah. this year. Uh, as wild as it sounds, though, every one of those have always been just connecting with people, right? Even that world record event I told you about. So the world yeah. record, um, the Guinness application process takes weeks, like months, yeah. right? And I remember we were maybe two weeks out from our event and I still was getting no response. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I told the world we're going to go break a world record yeah. and I can't get Guinness <laughs> to respond. Uh, and you know, the wild part is that I was chatting with Madeline Van Hoff over at uh, ShareHouse and she goes, hey, I actually, I know the VP of sales over there. And I was like, could you connect us? Wow. I mean, like literally connects me. Within three days, our application is approved. Incredible. Right? And so... And, I, and again, right, getting the blankets, connecting with the Make-A-Wish kids, getting a venue, finding sponsors, getting permits, getting insurance, all these things that I was like, I don't know. I don't know how to do any of this. It's always been one or two phone calls. And they have, like, the right person has always solved those problems. Uh, again, I know it sounds like somewhat cliched, but I am now a firm believer that the solution to any problem is maybe two handshakes away. Right, for any one of us. It's in the community. Right, yeah, it I is. That. Like the power of people moving in one direction together. Like I can't think of what we can't stop at that point. Yeah. Wow. There's so much. There's so many questions <laughs> that have come as, you know, just from that. But uh, I, I think I want to start and, and go back to, you know, those that are struggling right now because yeah. life is hard. <laughs> yeah. There is tough stuff that happens. And, I, I'm just so curious because it wasn't one person that helped you in your moment of need. Yeah. Or as we look back, moments of need. Absolutely. But it's the community, right? That really, really helped you. But I, I really want to kind of double click on from that post to the comments to then what, right? It, it's like, walk me through that. Yeah. Because I think again, where you talk about people that are just like, it's hard right now and that courage and maybe it wasn't just an immediate thing but there was a choice that i'm like this is where i'm going to go and i always i reflect on that almost every time you know that i that i see you and just the good that you're doing and the light that you bring to the community so inspiring but i want if you would just share what that moment was like yeah um honestly it was uh it was, an, it was a weird thing, right? Like looking back in life, you realize that sometimes your darkest moments are also massive blessings, right? I realize, I mean, honestly, at that point, like I had I had no Fs left to give, right? Like I just didn't <laughs> yeah. care anymore. Anything short of that, I don't think I could have made that post, right? Because I was too scared of what the backlash was going to be, right? I cared too much about what other people thought. Yeah. And looking back, I also realized in a, in a weird way, like it was my cry for help, right? And, uh, you know, and that's scary. Like we built a world that idolizes the, the strong, independent anybody, right? Like, you know, we, we still fall for this idea that there's like these self-made millionaires when the reality of it is that they all have friends and support networks and groups that, you know, help get them to where they are. 
But again, we idolize like the, oh, well, you should never ask for help, right? You should just figure it out and like just be strong and just power through it. Uh, and so again, a lot of it was, you know, not on purpose. There was no genius of my own. I just realized that I was at the point of such desperation, right? Just didn't care what people thought anymore, right? And it didn't come across. I didn't initially mean for it to be a cry for help, but it was a cry for help. Right? And even then, when first when people started first like reaching out, a lot of it was like, no, I'm fine. Thanks. I'm fine. Like, don't worry about it. Um, there is a, a lady who uh, her name's Christy Holt. She's the CEO of a company called Vibonics. And I really wanted to meet her. I don't know why. There's just something about her that I was like, oh, I want to meet you. Right. And I said, hey, can we go grab lunch? And she said, yes, in a week. And she said, I need you to go and spend the next seven days. And like, you need to go in nature for like every day for the next seven days and journal whatever you need to journal. And like, you don't need to share with like, I mean, what you write about, but just take a little bit of time for yourself. Right. And that was the first one. And I was like, okay, I don't know why, but like, I really want to meet this person. So like, I'll go do it. And I felt stupid doing it at yeah. first, but that turned into a much longer, like it went on much longer than seven days, right? I, I sat and I, I got to think and I got to meditate and I got to to start, I don't know, addressing parts of myself that I never really thought about, right? And then from there, it turned into like, okay, it was accepting that, you know, getting help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign that you want to keep fighting. And that's okay too, right? Like that's okay to ask for help but it's also okay to receive help when people are offering it. So that, you know, I think changed my perspective quite a bit as well of like, okay, all these people are offering to do stuff for me that they want to come talk to me. Right. And I, I made a goal at that point, like for the next six months, that's how much runway I had. Right. I was like, I want to go to lunch with someone every single day, uh, which again was not great for this, but <laughs> it helped me understand like different people different perspectives, like what does life mean to them, right? And it's a fascinating thing taking people to lunch when you don't have an agenda, right? Because I didn't have a business. I had nothing to sell. I had no, I wasn't marketing anything, right? There was, there was no pitch. Yeah. I just wanted to go to lunch with people. And I think, you know, for the first time, I really got to dive into that world of like, what is human connection, right? Like what happens when we take away the, the agenda or the goals out of a conversation and we just be? Right. And like intently live in those moments together. And again, that became my drug. Like I was just, I had fallen in love with like finding out about people's stories. Right. Like this idea of that, like the average person is this boring nine to fiver is not true. Like every person has stories of like immense struggle. Right. Right. Of overcoming immense challenges. You're right. Like life is hard. Mm -hmm. If you are here today, that means you fought to get here today. That's right. And again, who am I to judge the validity of your, your trials and challenges, right? Like I know, you know, I know amazing people that have broken world records for climbing mountains. And, you know, for them, like they would laugh at the little hills that I get winded on. <laughs> but for me, that's a challenge and that's yeah. okay, right? And like, I think that's the beauty of it, right? Is that if we just want to know people all of a sudden, uh, I mean, that was it though. Like that changed my whole perspective on life. It stopped being about me, right? It stopped being about what can you do for me. It turned into like, I want to learn about you and I just want to be here with you. And I think as I tried to connect with others more genuinely, uh, people also were more wanting to jump in and say, hey, well, like, I'm sorry, everything's falling apart. How do I, how do I help? Right? Can I pay your mortgage this month? Even little things like, can I buy lunch today? Yeah. Because right? I mean, I didn't have a lot of money, but I was still very determined to go to lunch with people. Yeah. Uh, but all these little things, man, and it really did show like the kindness and the amazingness and the generosity of, of humans. And that completely changed my mindset, right? Abundance became the idea, right? Scarcity started to go away, right? Before that, everyone was my competition, right? Everything was a zero sum game, right? If you win, that means I lose. And the reality is that we both win. Yeah. Right. We can all win. Yeah. Like, that's the, uh, it was such a. That's such a simple concept, but it took me a long time to figure it out, right? I, yeah. was, I think I was 35 before it finally clicked. <laughs> and um, I don't know, like all those things together showed me that life wasn't as scary as I put it. 
right? A lot of the pressures that I had put onto myself were only put on by me, right? I stopped comparing myself to other people, right? I, I wanted to compete against myself, right? I wanted to figure out how I help as many people along the way. And I, and I think that was like, a, again, a huge part of it is you just realize you don't want to play that game anymore, right? Yeah. And that was it. Oh, that's so awesome. Thanks so much for sharing of that. Course, Incredible. Man. And so much to unpack there. But as you think about it in those darkest moments, right? A little bit of hope. There's just some small ray of hope that led to insight, that led to action. You know, I had a, I've been blessed with really amazing mentors. And something you just said like resonated or reminded me. Um, you know, he said, hey, for a bright light to shine in a bright room, it has to be very, very bright, right? But when you're in a completely dark room, you just need a, even a small match makes a significant amount of light, right? And he just talked about perspective. He said, when you're in a dark spot, like you don't need to worry about being the sun yet. You can just be a candle, right? And then as your whole life starts to lighten up, you can get brighter too. But like, stop worrying about, again, you don't have to be the sun on day one. Like, just figure out how to have enough light in your life to get out of just the immediate darkness. And uh, you're right. Like, that little ray of hope, that little ray of light goes a long way when you feel like everything else has fallen apart. Yeah. Wow. So awesome. So, <laughs> so many great insights. Thanks so much for sharing that, too. Yeah, of course, man. And, and our hope, you know, more than anything, at you know, through these conversations that we have, is to provide that hope yeah. and that light in what seems to be an increasingly dark, challenging time. There's so many amazing things that are happening. Sure. There's also a lot of challenging things. I think it's an opportunity, you know, your perspective of, I get really excited too when I make it to the top of stairs, right? <laughs> and it's a new perspective, yeah. right? But one of the great things about, I think, being here in the great state of Utah is the beautiful surroundings that we have. Yeah. And within a matter of moments, we can have a different perspective and and realize and look around and see that there's opportunities yeah. and this idea of coming together and that we are here to support and lift each other is so inspiring. And I think you are an, a, just an incredible example of that. Um, and I always say that one of the greatest ironies in life is the more we think about ourselves, the unhappier we are. Yeah. And the, the minute we start to think about someone else and how we can help lift, bless, uh, in either some small way that we may be able to make their day. And interestingly enough, I don't know how this works is our day is made too. You know, we do it in, in a genuine way, but you're an amazing example about that. Oh. What, what brings you joy now? <laughs> you know, uh, it, that has changed. You know, uh, I spent a lot of time again, I used to think it was nice cars and fancy dinners and you know all the exclusive whatever. Uh, I don't know. Playing board games with my friends. Uh, I have. I was a total like skater punk in in middle school and high school. A year ago, my wife bought me uh, an electric longboard. Awesome. I just broke like six hundred and fifty miles on it. Wow! <laughs> I know uh, that brings me a ton of joy. It is like my <laughs> that's so great. It's like my zen. I get on that board and like everything else just disappears for a little while. Especially you don't have to push. Yeah, that's amazing. Right? <laughs> you just go. I mean, you go do ten miles easy on that thing. Uh, again, just being with people. You know, being with my wife, being with my kids, um, meeting people. Like I love meeting people. I love hearing their stories. Uh, I love seeing them find success, right? And if I can be a small part of that, then that brings me a ton of joy. Uh, even these events, like, I mean, there's times I, I hate the events, right? They're, uh, it's a hell of a thing to put on some of these events. Can't imagine. A lot of sleepless nights before and after probably. It is. Uh, actually, no, after I sleep <laughs> after really you're well. After you right. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm passing out after. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, it's it just that, right? Um we did a conference earlier this year. It was, it was called Let's Talk About It because, you know, dad joke. It was great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being there. Um, you know, and the, the cool thing is that um, the day after, uh, an individual who attended called me and um, she said that we really needed to meet. I said, yeah, okay, like, let's do it. 
And um, so I think we met on like that Friday or whatever at a coffee shop. And um, she told me that she was uh, she was planning on committing suicide that day. Right. And um, her friend invited her last minute. And, uh, you know, she said seeing all these people who are so like open and vulnerable talking about mental health and finding your purpose in life and overcoming adversity like it. I mean, it literally saved her life. Right. And I, I can only take a very, very small piece of that credit. Um, but yeah, I mean, when, when you, you know, I tell my team all the time, like we don't get to see how far the, the ripples go and that, that's okay. Right. We put good into the world and we take it on faith that like that good is going to go out and touch somebody. Right. But it was also really amazing to actually hear from someone how, how like that event mattered to them. Right. And again, you know, I, I talk to my team a lot, but I say like, how do you, how do you put a dollar value on that? Right. Like at what point is, you know, at what point should we give up on these events when we know that they're actually helping real people? Right. I know of another guy who met his, uh, they're going to get married this summer. <laughs> like, wow. He met his fiance at an earlier, <laughs> at one of our earlier events. Right. I know of partnerships that have been formed, investment deals that have been made, uh, you know, clients that have been found, startups that have started. Like, how do I put a dollar value on any of those? Right. And again, it's not me. It's not about me. I'm not, I'm not investing in these. I'm not getting a piece of all these mm -hmm. deals, right? But we just want to create the safe place where human connection happens. And that, that brings me a lot of joy. That's so awesome. That, that is, I think, so well articulated at how I would, what is, what is Paul Shin to, to <laughs> me and to so many, someone who just selflessly shows up well, and it's, a, not, it's, it's not a builder. It's not selfless. Yeah. I feel, again, it brings me a lot of joy yeah. to do it. So, But you're a builder, which is amazing. And you think about what you've built and what you've done and to see the ups and the downs, right? And to give people hope and hopefully a little bit of clarity around, around challenging times when things happen, sure. where to turn, where to look. Uh, so much, so much great insight. What would you, what would you share? Let's say your, your kids are listening to this down the road. What, <laughs> sure. what would you, what would you hope for them to hear or know? Uh, you know, th there's probably, there's probably a couple things. Um, the world has this interesting thing, right? Where it, it tells us that none of us are that important. And I, I know I've talked a lot about the, the like how each of us can make a great impact, right? And I was guilty of that too. Like I remember thinking like, oh man, once I make more money, like then I can help somebody, right? right? Or once I have more authority or more power or a better title, like then I can help somebody, right? Um, and really like the difference is that like, or the reality is that we can help someone today, today. right? Like right now there's someone in your circle that you could go help and that's okay. Like you can do it right now as you are, you are enough. Uh, that I think that would be kind of the, the first thing. And then the second thing, again, it goes back to the, the opposite side of that, right? Is when you need help, it is okay to ask for help. Uh, you know, I, I talked to two entrepreneurs, uh, recently, one who was on the verge of potentially losing his home and the other one who, um, made plans to also commit suicide, right? And the conversation ended up being, look, when you ask for help, not only are you helping yourself now, but you're giving permission to the next person to let them know it's okay to ask for help, right? Because the idea is that we all fall into this trap and think that nobody else is asking so for help, good. right? And like we, someone has to do it. Someone has to ask for help and then let other people know that, hey, I went through that with you. Right. I know where you're at. Uh, when I, when I, so when I talk to God, uh, it is in my car, I go to my garage and I sit in my car and I just talk to him out loud. And I remember, um, months and months ago, but I was asking him like, God, like, why is this so hard? <laughs> right. Like, like I've given up chasing dollars and, and fame and like, I want to just help people. Right. Like, we, my, my family's sacrificing a lot. We're not going on a vacation this summer and that's fine. Like we're doing a lot to, to be able to survive, but also like give back everything we can. I said, like, God, like, why, why are you making this so hard for me, man? Yeah. Like help me out, dude. Yeah. 
And uh, I remember as I sat there in, in, in reflection, you know, the two things that came to me, one was uh, I had more help than I realized. And two, um, I remember God, like, I remember just getting this feeling that said, like, there is no shortcut here, right? If one day you want to be able to stand in front of someone else and tell them, you can do this. And I know you can because I've been through something hard and I survived it. And I know you can too, right? Like, I know where you're at. The only way to be able to say that is to actually go through it. Right. If you don't experience the trials, then you don't get to stand in front of someone else and say, I believe in you or you can do it, too, because you haven't done it. Right. And um, I don't know, that changed my perspective because I was kind of angry. I, I remember thinking like God owed me something like God owed that this should be a success because I'm only here to do good in the world. And the reality was that God didn't owe me anything. Right. I just had to accept like when you choose to build. It is hard, but that gives you the, that is the the badge of honor that lets you stand in front of someone else and say, Hey, like, keep dreaming. I know where you're at, right? It's okay to be a dreamer. It's okay to chase these things down. It's okay to want to build, but it will be hard for you too, but you can get through it. And, uh, I don't know. I know it was a lot of things, but I, I probably leave my kids with those things. That is so good. So much so much wisdom there. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, course, it's incredible man. because there is, when you think about this and, you know, as, as we're on top of this mound or hill together, sure. you know, looking back at these experiences that we have, it's the moments that matter yeah. the most. And it's the experiences that we have with each other yeah. that matter the most. And it is the hope and the light and the direction to be able to say, you can do this. Yeah you can do it. There's so much worth living for because I see the impact that you're making. And I would just say on behalf of so many other people, thanks for you being a light in our community now to others who need it. I mean, that's, it's just so cool to see that Paul and to, and to share those stories of, I was in a dark place. I reached out for help. Someone else was in a dark place and you were that light to them, which yeah. is just a true testament of what an extraordinary community we have it really is. here in Utah, but also to be able to connect with people around the world with technology to offer that same kind of hope and help um, that is available through coming together. Yeah. I love that idea of coming together. Um, anything else that you want to share, Paul? This has been so amazing. <laughs> um, so much wisdom. I've learned so much. I genuinely appreciate you taking your time uh, with us today to help share your story. I know you've got an event coming up. Yeah. You uh, want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> let's chat about it a little bit. Uh, so June 29th will be, uh, the, sorry, there'll be a second year at the University of, University of Utah uh, on the football field. Uh, so if you are a big Utes fan, this is your opportunity to quite literally be on their field, uh, come kick a field goal, catch a touchdown pass, uh, we are supporting an organization called Refugee Soccer. Uh, a guy named Adam Mills uh, founded it. Uh, Utah is a refugee state, so we have people from all over the world end up here. Hmm. And Adam realized that where you know culture and language may become a barrier for a lot of people, soccer is almost universal. universal. I mean, yeah. Pretty much outside of the the U.S., right? right. And so he creates like these soccer camps and ways for, you know, these refugee families to come together to play soccer and to make friends and to, to find community together. Uh, and so he'll actually be bringing some of the refugee kids. We're going to set up a couple soccer fields, come play with them. Uh, and the hope is that we'll be able to raise enough money at the event that uh, we can send the girls to the, the Women's World Cup later this year. Wow. Uh, again, which I think would just be a, an extraordinary experience. Uh, we have lots of other communities coming together. We're super excited. You know, the goal is to get a thousand people out on that field and to, to just be together for a day. So. That's awesome. How can we learn more and find and support you? Yeah. Uh, just tacos together.com that has all the, all the contact info, the next set of events are all up on there. And, uh, you know, we're, we're excited to, to connect with you guys. So great. Paul, thanks for coming in. Oh, it was my pleasure. What an incredible conversation. And thanks again for being an inspiration to me and so many. I hope everyone who's who's listening, man, I wish I would have had some something to type or take notes, but I'm glad we get to re-listen <laughs> uh, to it again. But thank you for all you do. 
yeah. for this community and for for me personally genuinely appreciate you taking some time today well th same goes to you man you do a lot of good thank you for having me on Thanks so much for listening to the Lemonade Stand podcast, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use to be alerted when we release new episodes. We'd also love to hear your feedback in the reviews, and if you or someone you know has an awesome Lemonade Stand story, please reach out to us on social media and let us know. Thanks so much, and have a great day.